As always, I will begin tonight's festivities with a land acknowledgement. Nimitz Publishing and Open Book are located in Mi'kma'ki, the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Mi'kmaq. We are grateful guests on this land, and we acknowledge that it is the stewardship of the Mi'kmaq people over the land and the water over thousands of years that allows us to be here today. We at Nimbus have made a lifelong pledge to reconciliation and decolonization. We welcome you to join us to work toward allyship and understanding for a more equitable society. And equality is the theme of the evening. Senator Oliver's story is one that will educate, provoke, and inspire. It's a story every one of us should know and one that we at Nimbus hope will be passed on for generations. And if anyone here has the ear of the Department of Education, we'd really like to see it in the schools as well. <laughs> Uh, now, I imagine you're all at least a little familiar with Senator, Senator Oliver's life and work, but I'd like to tell you a little bit about the book we're all here to celebrate tonight, A Matter of Equality. Growing up in the only black family in Wolfville, Nova Scotia, Donald Oliver felt duty-bound to honor his great-grandparents, who had fled slavery in the United States. His childhood, surrounded by music, family, and respected, hard-working role models, was idyllic. His family's fundamental family creed was... Work hard, be humble, love the Lord, and do all you can to help other people. Donald Oliver would go on to embody those values in a big way. In his long-anticipated memoir, which you can pick up next door, <laughs> Oliver, now retired, looks back at a life lived in service to others. In his own careful and thoughtful words, he examines his days as a lawyer, an outspoken social activist, and a teacher, and of course, he reflects on his 23 years of service as a member of the Senate of Canada. A diplomat to his core, Donald Oliver has dedicated his life to rooting out the systemic racism that has stalled the growth of black citizens in Canada. His work is a testament to the truth that black lives matter. Now, through dozens of black and white and colored images and through intimate personal reflections, a matter of equality, the life's work of Senator Don, Don Oliver examines the legacy of the first man and the second Canadian to bring the black experience directly to the upper house. I'd now like to introduce our adult nonfiction editor, Angela Momberkett, an award-winning journalist and the author of 25 Years of 22 Minutes, an unauthorized oral history of This Hour Has 22 Minutes. <laughs> <laughs> also available next door. Uh, <laughs> Angela and Senator Oliver are going to have a Q&A up here, after which I think there'll be time for some audience questions. Um, and we're going to have a reading from Senator Oliver. Books are for sale, as I've mentioned. Um, and Senator Oliver will be pleased to sign many, many cards copies for you after this. Um, and just a reminder to keep your masks on throughout, except when you're eating and drinking. <laughs> um, and if you need a breather, our patio outside is available to you as well. And now please welcome the Honorable Donald Oliver and Angela Mombertin. Thanks very much, Whitney. Uh, as Whitney said, I'm the nonfiction editor here at Nimbus, and I'm, uh, I was so pleased to work with the senator on his memoir. Um, and uh, as Whitney said, I, I had a bunch of things here I was going to say, and Whitney said them all. <laughs> Sorry. I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, so we're going to do this as a, a little bit of a Q&A, just so between the senator and I, we'll talk a, a little bit about some stories from his life and stories from the book. So uh, I'm going to start off uh, just at the very beginning. I'm going to jump in and ask you, tell us how this book came to be. Well, it's really a long story. It, it took place over a decade. Uh, I, I didn't think that I had the ability to write a book, and I didn't have a lot of uh, faith in my own writing, and so I went to many senior journalists and said, what would you recommend I do? And I was given a number of names and uh, uh, met a number of journalists and a number of them started to write and a number of them gathered information, but it didn't ever get too far uh, with one possible exception. And uh, uh, then after I retired uh, and I said, look, I, 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 I've got to start doing something. And so I started trying to write a little bit at home in my den and then one day I had a call from May Ann, your Honorable May Ann Francis, and she said, you know, there should be a book uh, outlining some of the things you've done. And I said, well, I've already started to put a few words to writing. She said, but I know of an author, John Tatry, who could help put some structure into what you're, you're writing, and that may help. And so 
we had a Zoom call, and, and luckily for me, both John Tattree and May Ann had a good relationship with Nimbus, and uh, Nimbus has been nothing but generous with their time and their talent in helping bring the book forward very quickly. Because of my health conditions, I, when I met with Nimbus, I didn't know if I'd be alive even now in time to see this launch, and so they moved me up in their schedule so my book could get out uh, in advance of some others, and I, I just don't know how to say thank you for, for, for doing that. And, and, uh, but now, the main, the main uh, thing behind it is I had difficulty myself determining what I wanted to write and what kinds of things were important and what drove my life. I, I had, as uh, Whitney has told us, 23 years as a politician in the Senate, Senate of Canada. I had uh, 25 years as a practicing lawyer. I had uh, a long life uh, of, of working in agriculture and I export Christmas trees and sell logs and do uh, sell hay, do other things in agriculture. Uh, in, uh, in addition to that, I've had uh, uh, 35 years of business of various kinds. I was very heavily into real estate and many, many other businesses over the years. So, so what, was I going to write about business? Was I going to write about being a senator, public policy, or what? Well, the overriding thing was I was born uh, in a family in a town of 2,000 people at the time, Wolfville, Nova Scotia. And we were the only black family there. And so I finally posed the question, what role has your blackness had in the things that you have done in life and haven't done in life, and how has it influenced uh, the things that you've tried to contribute back to society? And so I, I finally found that to be the theme, and that is the theme I hope I got in this book, and, uh, and trying to show that just because you're black or because you're a First Nation person or you are a visible minority, so-called, it doesn't mean that you are not equal. And so I was trying to find a place where all people could be treated equally, hence the title. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't hurt that you had some history as a journalist as well. <laughs> right. <laughs> but the, you know, the themes in your book, one of the key themes is, is, is rooting out systemic anti-black racism and making the business case for diversity um, in Canada. Um, tell me why those things were so important to you as the central themes of your book. Well, I remember when I was in the Senate, I, I was shocked to find that of the administrative staff in the Senate when I was there, there was not one visible minority or black hire in five years, even as a janitor or sweeping floors or, you know, or uh, there were no, no people of color chosen. And so I started making speeches and then I had a meeting with, you would call it the CEO of the Senate, the CEO of the House of Commons, the CEO of the Library of Parliament. And I called them together and I said, I'd like to see your numbers and they had none. And I said, this is not acceptable. And uh, so I said, I'm going to start speaking out about this and changes have to be made. And uh, changes have been made as a result of that. Then I went to the clerk of the Privy Council uh, who is the uh, head of all bureaucrats in Canada, over 300,000 employees. And uh, he, uh, at the time, before COVID, they would have a weekly meeting called the, the DM's Breakfast, where the clerk would preside. And I was invited to two of them, uh, the only senator that I know of ever having that privilege, to go to those private breakfasts where there would be 40 of the senior DMs around an oval table. And uh, I was asked to speak about lack of diversity and why the public service of Canada did not reflect the mosaic of Canada. And uh, so I made a number of recommendations there and we talk about that a bit in the book as well. So that's, uh, that's what happened on, on, on the, the business case for diversity. But the one big thrust really came uh, when um, I was in a, a, the bank, a banker from, from Toronto had invited me for lunch. And it was a big, tall bank building, 40, 50 stories high. And I was taken up by appointment for lunch in his office. 
And uh, uh, as I walked into the big corner office, I didn't see any women and I didn't see any people of color. And after we said, look, it's a nice sunny day, here's what you can see from here and so on, I said, you know, when I walked in your office, I didn't see any women and I didn't see any people of color. And uh, he said, oh, we hire the best. If they were good, they would be here along with the men. And uh, uh, then I said, well, you know, I didn't even see one. And, and uh, so then he got a little closer to me and he raised his voice a little bit and he said, look, if you're suggesting we're prejudiced around here, we're not. And we hire only the best. And you're a lawyer and you're a good practicing lawyer. What are your facts? What's your proof that we discriminate against either women or, or blacks or visible minorities? And I had none. I had no data. So I said, I have to find some and uh, so I have to do uh, a new independent study in Canada to get the kind of statistics and data that was needed. So I went to uh, f friends like Scott Mullen at the TD Bank, and his sister's here tonight, by the way, and, uh, and to Paul Deegan at the Bank of Montreal. Scott gave me 50000 I then went to the Deputy Minister of uh, Treasury Board, and uh, he gave me 50000 So for that 100 I then picked up the phone and phoned people like Bell Canada and uh, Ted Rogers and others, and I soon had $500,000 that was required to do the study. I gave the money to the Conference Board of Canada, and I said I wanted the biggest, largest, most comprehensive, thorough research study on whether there are barriers to the advancement of visible minorities in both the public and the private sectors, and it resulted in a report, uh, and the report's bottom line is you will succeed in Canada today uh, as you did in the past if you believe in diversity because diversity counts, diversity matters, and it works. And diversity means that you accept difference. Just because someone has a, a different preference uh, than you do, a different hair color, uh, my hair is curly, by the way. <laughs> you don't have that. But then accept difference, you know, and, and go to what uh, Martin Luther King called the char your character. That's what really counts, and be judged by that. And so um, after the conference board report was published, we had internet in those days, and went on the internet, and countries like Denmark and Sweden and Norway and Brazil and London, England, said, we would like you to come and give lectures to our senior bureaucrats and to our, our business community on how that can possibly work. How can you bring people in who speak different languages and, and how does it possibly work? Well, I remember very clearly that when I was in, in, in London as a keynote speaker there for a diversity conference, that uh, I was next to a person from Google, a very the European representative for Google, and he showed me a picture of some of the meetings that they had in Google at that time, and they were incredibly diverse. People from all over the world, from Japan, from China, from Brazil, from Mexico, and uh, they, 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 that's why Google is so progressive, because they believed in the business case for diversity. Diversity works, don't be afraid of difference. And so that's, that's, that's how it happened. Um, those of you who have a copy of the book in your hand see that uh, we have uh, a forward, two forwards in fact, one by Brian Mulroney and one by George Elliot Clark. Now sometimes it's a problem to get someone to write a forward for a book. Uh, in this case, we had more than enough people who were happy to contribute to the book very, very generously. Tell me about uh, Brian Mulroney and George Elliot Clark and your relationship with them. I started Acadia uh, in my first year in 1956, and Brian was at St. Effects then. And um, Brian was a very well-known conservative commodity throughout the entire province. You know, he had that beautiful speaking voice and that powerful voice. He was an organizer. Uh, he was uh, close to Diefenbaker, and uh, he was just organizing young conservatives in Nova Scotia as Art Donahue can tell you, and Art is here tonight, and uh, the person who really encouraged me strongly to become a young progressive conservative was Arthur Donahue, 
And uh, I want to thank him for that, but he, uh, he said, look, there's going to be a conference going on in, in, in Halifax over the weekend. I lived in Moorfield. He said, you should come in and, uh, and uh, because we are organizing young progressive conservatives in Nova Scotia. And I did come in and I remember that I stayed in the home of the person who wrote, Bob Chambers' home, who wrote the, the cartoons. And that was, that was a thrill in itself, you know, <laughs> just, just, but, uh, uh, so, um, that's, 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 um, Br Brian then went, become a lawyer and I became a lawyer. He became a businessman and as a lawyer and a businessman, we exchanged views and then he decided to run. And the first time he decided to run in 1976, I organized the province of Nova Scotia for him. I was the principal organizer in Nova Scotia. I met him at the airport in the private jet that he flew in from Power Corporation at the time and um, introduced him to some people who might raise some funds for him and so on and organized uh, throughout that. We didn't win it, but won the next time. And uh, did you want me to go on and say when, uh, when I finally got the call? Yeah, let's jump ahead to that. But before you do that, I just want to tell everyone that Mr. Mulroney phoned me when he was writing the foreword to this book. And I picked up the phone and he said, Angela. <laughs> I was like, hello, Brian Mulroney. <laughs> and then he read me the entire foreword, every word of it. He said, I just want to know if I'm doing the right thing. I was like, okay, keep reading. <laughs> so, anyway, yes, now, yeah, let's jump ahead. So in your career later on, uh, you received a fateful call from Brian Mulroney. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I had mentioned earlier I had, had some business interests. Well, I, I was involved with some Germans in a major real estate deal, and I used to have to go to Germany almost once a month for meetings. And uh, then uh, uh, I was in the Toronto uh, interviewing some Japanese possible investors, uh, investors for this, this event. And we, the accountant we were using was Deloitte's. So Deloitte's had given me their boardroom for our meetings. And uh, everything that was being said had to be translated from Japanese to English and English to Japanese. So it was taking quite a while. And uh, then one day uh, in this conference room, the phone in the corner rang. So I went over and picked it up and, I, and it said, is this Don Oliver? And I said, yes. Well, this is the Prime Minister's office. We've been looking for you for days. Where have you been? <laughs> and, and, and I said, look, I'm in Toronto having some business meetings. They said, well, look, don't move. The Prime Minister wants to talk to you. Hang up this phone, and in exactly 15 minutes, the phone's going to ring again, and it'll be the Prime Minister. So I, said, I ran into the room, and I said to the Japanese, would you mind sitting in the ante room? I'm, going to get, I'm expecting a call. It's very important. So they, they didn't understand fully what it was about. They did go, and they were, they were there. The phone rang in 15 minutes, and I heard this voice that answered, Donnie, how's Linda? <laughs> And how was Carol? And, uh, I, and believe it or not, he, he went through. Is, is Linda still working in telecommunications and stuff? Carolyn's still in private school and this and that. And he asked to make sure that he was talking to the right person. And when he was, he said, Look, uh, you have uh, helped an awful lot of people over an awful number, number of years, and you've never really received any kind of reward. And you've always worked as a volunteer. You were 25 years the lawyer for the Conservative Party of Canada without pay. And he said, but I am going to reward you by offering you a seat in the Senate of Canada. And the phone went mute. <laughs> I couldn't speak, my heart was pounding. And I don't think I said anything for at least 30 seconds, which is a long period. And finally I said, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> and the next day, Brian said to his staff, the next time you're talking to Donnie Oliver, Ask him if he knows how many times he said thank you. <laughs> but uh, so so that's that's how that started uh, just by by that call, and uh, he said uh, you have to say you accept, and as soon as you say I accept, you're on the payroll. So I said I accept. <laughs> yeah. I said that that day before. <laughs> and George Elliot Clark, how are, how do you know George? George is my cousin, and he's a brilliant writer. He's a brilliant poet. 
He's a, a great personality. He's a lot of fun to be with. He's a wordsmith, and uh, he he is just uh, 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 he he reads everything and remembers everything. And he's just so much fun to be around. And uh, so he uh, wanted was going to write a little little three or four liner. And George can't wait for four lines. <laughs> so it ended up that, that uh, you know, Whitney and Angela said, look, we, we've got to make this into a forward. But Brian's done the forward, so maybe, maybe we'll have two forwards. So, so we, we have two forwards in the book because George's was so, so well written. It was beautiful. And he also contributed a poem, which um, was also like thousands of words long. <laughs> Wonderful, and it was a tribute to you on one of your birthdays, I think. My 80th. Yeah. Yes, uh, we were going to try and incorporate it somehow, but in the end, we didn't have enough pages to, <laughs> to accommodate that, sadly. But um, but he, yeah, he was very generous to do to do that. Um, you, one of the things I wanted to ask you, you know, you were a student, a law student at Dalhousie in your early years. Mm -hmm. Um, you had, there's a story in the book about you uh, and a friend who went out to a pool hall. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us uh, what happened that day? I was at the Housie as a Sir James Dunn scholar, and there were five of us at the time. And one of them was from Saskatchewan, a white guy. His name was Daryl T. Warren, and we called him Del, D-E-L. And we became friends. He and his wife had me to their apartment for dinner a couple of times. And I think that they wanted, they'd never been in Eastern Canada. They wanted to learn about the East. They wanted to learn more about black Canadians. And uh, this was the home of black Canadians in all of Canada. So uh, they would ask me questions about that. So one day we took an afternoon off from studying, decided to go and play some pool. And uh, uh, I, I agreed and he agreed. And it's a good way, way to find out more about the character of the person you've been dealing with. It's a, it's a good way to uh, to uh, just uh, exercise some skills. So we, we picked out a place that was close to the law school, a place called the Q and Cushion, uh, as it then was. And so we went down to the Q and Cushion. Uh, it was not busy mid-afternoon, and uh, very few people there. We each picked up our, our pool cue off the rack racked the balls, hit the balls, and I started shooting. And uh, uh, when I was very young in my teens, uh, I would be paid 25 cents if I shot all 15 balls without missing. And I, 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 I knew a bit about that game, so I was having a pretty good run to start. And when I turned around, Dell was not there. And then m moments later, he came in, he said, drop your cue, leave it on the table, and come with me. And he was limping. He was dragging one foot after another. I said, my goodness, what has happened? So I followed him out of the pool room. We got out to the front, and there was a man there, cigarette in his mouth, and he looked at me with a big scar on. And he basically said, you can't, you can't be in here. You can't stay here. You've got to get out of here. You can stay, Dell, but you have to get out. And, uh, and I said, there was no sign saying I, black people were not allowed to, in your pool room. You have to get out and get out now. So we left. And uh, so we were walking back to the law school and I said, Del, you're not limping now. Why were you limping when you came to see me? He said, I didn't want to have to repeat to you some of the things the man said about you and your color uh, in there. So I said, if I went in limping, I knew you would follow me without question and you did. So there was no altercation in the hall. And then I, I began thinking about it, thinking about it, thinking about it, and I said, I think that Dell was more upset about that incident than I was. Uh, he was a white man who had never really encountered that kind of overt anti-black racism. And uh, it hit him right in the face really hard, and he didn't know how to deal and cope with it. So we talked about it a lot. But uh, what happened with me is that I picked up the phone and I phoned the, the government of Nova Scotia and said, my rights have just been violated because of the color of my skin. And I think that's wrong. Something's got to be done about it. And they said, look, we're going to have someone from the Justice Department phone you back. They phoned me back and they said, we're working on a bill 
uh, that might uh, do something about your situation. We're going to send you the draft copy. And we'd like, like your views on it. And you feel free to mark it up and make any suggestions you want. Well, it was uh, called the Fair Accommodation Practices Act. I made a number of changes in the bill to try to strengthen it, sent it back to the government, the legislature passed it, and it basically said that I, because of the color of my skin, could not be kept out of a place to which the public was customarily invited. And that became the law. And so to make a long story short, the queue and cushion said, we still don't want you black people in our hall. <laughs> and so they said, uh, we, we want our lawyers to incorporate us under the Societies Act of Nova Scotia, so we become a private society. And private societies can choose who they want for their membership. And uh, so uh, they became a private society, and I didn't apply for membership. <laughs> Fair. Um, it's amazing to see how, you know, that single event led you to create change, and I think that's a theme that uh, we follow through the book and throughout your life. Um, you have a story, you've met some incredible people in your life, including Barack Obama, um, and there's a story in, in the book about you as a young man standing in the Rose Garden with JFK. Yes. I was quite young at the time, in fact, I just finished first year law, and I had been asked to go to uh, Ethiopia, uh, the, uh, the home of, uh, of civilization, some people say, uh, on an Operation Crossroads Africa uh, trip. We had to, uh, had, had to pay our own way over, so I got many jobs I, uh, mowing the lawn, doing all kinds of other things to raise the money that I needed for the trip. And then we had our final orientation in Washington, a week in Washington where they taught us a lot of things about uh, diseases, uh, about uh, the things that we had to avoid. Don't walk in water in your bare feet because of, uh, uh, I think it's called schistosomiasis or something like that. And, and they gave us all kinds of other medical advice, cultural advice, and uh, uh, lecture, lectures in politics and other things that we needed to know before going. And uh, so uh, at, at the end, uh, the o Operation Crossroads Africa was the child of a black uh, clergyman by the name of Reverend uh, Robinson. And Reverend Robinson was a friend of John F. Kennedy. And Kennedy liked what he was doing by taking young Americans, as it then was, over to Africa, having them work in various communities on getting clean water, building a school, helping with uh, uh, education uh, and training. And, uh, and the two of them talked a lot about it in the White House. And uh, so Reverend Robinson said, look, I've got a group coming that are getting ready to go to Ethiopia and other countries in Africa. And I thought it might be nice if they could come and meet you and you could tell them about your vision. So we went to the lawn uh, and uh, JFK came out and his famous words were that you are the progenitor of the Peace Corps. This is where I got the idea for the Peace Corps from Reverend Robinson and the work you're doing with Operation Crossroads Africa. Now, I, I didn't get to shake his hand, but I saw him. I took a picture like this with him and so on. But he's, uh, uh, he was shorter than I thought he was going to be. <laughs> But a very, very impressive speaker. You know, he had this New England accent that, that the, the, the family all had, and uh, it just it just moved you. But he he was just a great politician, and if he were alive, he could have continued to do a lot of great things. So, and sorry I'm so long on my stories. Uh, no, <laughs> that's perfect. The other thing is, uh, I think you may have been a little more excited about the roses in the Rose Garden. Yes, that's right. <laughs> he, he, Believe it or not, J.F. himself loved gardens and loved flowers, and he and Jackie completely redid the Rose Garden. And uh, the second to the last president of the United States redid them as well. But uh, Jack Jackie's had some beautiful, beautiful roses, and, and uh, I mean, it was people were coming from all over the world 
to see it, so it's a, it, and it was his love, those, that, those gardens. And yours too. It is. Yeah. That uh, Africa trip was, um, in, it was important in your life in some ways. How, how so? It was like going back home, you know, I, 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 as I said, came from, uh, brought up in a white town, the only black family in the town. And, uh, and suddenly being in a situation where all the people were black, we were, the group that I was with, we were building an extension to an existing school, 73 foot extension, and, we, uh, and it was made of rocks, and we carried rocks on our shoulders for days and days and days, and the rocks were held together by a mixture called chica, mud, straw, and water. And, uh, and they were put together and held up, and they, they lost like cement. And uh, uh, I, uh, I remember one time uh, when we had an afternoon off from lifting these rocks and carrying these rocks that we were out in the community walking around and, and we had been given a Polaroid land camera at the time. They were brand new and it's a camera that you could press a button, take someone's picture and then you'd hear and the thing would come out and soon uh, you'd shake it a little bit and suddenly you could see the image of a person. Well, we took an image of, of an African person and they had never seen their image before. And uh, then later on, uh, I, I was the only black in our group, the other Americans that I was with were white. And I think there were about six of us this particular day and the Africans, through an interpreter, said, um, you know, we have never seen white people before. It's so funny. But they, they turned their head and covered their hand like that because they didn't want to think that they were laughing at them. But it was, it was a surprise. They'd never seen white people before. And uh, so it's, uh, uh, that was just a wonderful experience. But it was returning back home, and uh, it... Uh, it, uh, it was quite an experience. I don't have it in the book, but we had to draw, we ran out of food because you, you, if you didn't take it, you couldn't eat it like the, their cattle was tubercular. And uh, there were, and, and the, there had been a severe drought. None of the crops made it. Uh, there wasn't any sorghum flour or anything that you could buy. There was no grocery store, no, no general store, no drug store, no nothing. And so if, if you didn't bring it, you had to go for it. So I had to go up to Eritrea. I was chosen by a straw to go by myself to Eritrea uh, to get uh, groceries and so on. And uh, I don't write about it in the book, but that was a, that was a, a very awesome trip. Uh, yeah, I would imagine sort of character forming. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of groceries, you and I, share a love of cooking. This is something I, that maybe some people, well, people who know you personally probably know this, but I think probably members of the public don't know this about you, that Don is a Cordon Bleu trained chef. I am not. <laughs> <laughs> but tell me, what's, uh, tell me what's uh, one of your favorite dishes? I know there's a story there. Uh, look, I want to identify a couple of other people who are here first to say, like Joan Craig is here, and Joan and her husband and I took cooking courses way, way back from a woman called Philippa Montserrat. And uh, she did them in classes. And then I had private lessons from Philippa. And then I went to the advanced court on Blue in London. And then Linda and I went to Italy to study cooking and various things. But, but Joan and Jack and I cooked together. And, and uh, one of the memorable meals that I remember cooking, Joan and Jack said, look, uh, we have this wonderful big house in the South End. Wouldn't it be great, great if you could cook it there and we could have the guests there because we had sold a, a, a table an evening uh, to raise money for Neptune Theater. We raised $10,000 uh, because people paid uh, $1,000 a plate for the food we were going to cook. The food you were cooking. So, and so the main dish was pheasant. And, uh, and I'm sure that Joan remembers, and John Neville was uh, one of the waiters who came in and served, <laughs> served the dish, and, and, uh, and Mrs. Evans was uh, the, the uh, waitress, Joan Evans. And uh, uh, so that, that was a very, very memorable night. And uh, there, so I just, 
cooking is is the, the thing that I would go to. I, it thri throughout most of my life, I worked 13 hour days, not because I needed the money, because I loved to work, and and uh, and and. But the way I got relief was to go to the kitchen, and I just love creating. And now with my bad legs and bad heart and bad everything else, I really can't entertain and cook much more. Although uh, for for Thanksgiving I made made green tomato uh, chow and I made the stuffing for Linda's turkey, so that's the extent of my cooking now. But I, I thoroughly enjoy it, and uh, it's just it's just a great way of being able to express yourselves. Thank you. So uh, we have a, there are a lot of wonderful stories in the book, as you're hearing. Um, we want to end. I know you have a particularly funny story that uh, we want to end with uh, from your wedding. And uh, I think you're going to read a little bit for us. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. I didn't get married until late in life because I had all these other interests that I wanted to, that I've already told you about. But um, finally, uh, I met Linda, and, and we, uh, we uh, had decided that one day we would tie the knot, didn't have dates or anything like that. And uh, the year before we got married, I went to China for 21 days uh, in 1980. And uh, in those days, Beijing had very, very few cars, and it was 99% bicycles. And it was bicycles 18 years wide going up the streets of Beijing and so on. And rarely would, would you have a, a jewelry shop or something like that. And I remember seeing in one side street, a man called me in and uh, for the equivalent of a penny, he said, if you get on these scales, I will tell you your weight. And I said to myself, that's the beginning of free enterprise, you know? <laughs> you know you, you know, I'm, I'm sure you're giving, giving a service for, for money. And, it's, it's just, it, and, and look at them today from, from, from that. Anyway, I, I, I bought a lot of silk, beautiful silk, because it was so inexpensive, and Chinese silk is so beautiful for my mother and my sisters and, and friends. And I, I decided I might as well get something for myself, so I bought some white silk that I was gonna have some nice silk shirts made for my law practice. And, uh, and, and um, we had uh, the usual uh, wedding rehearsal and went through all the next day's procedures from the vows to the rings. I felt prepared. Our waiting day brought sun and heat with a slight afternoon breeze cooling the north lawn at the farm. We stood under a 100-year-old maple tree. My mother made an absolutely beautiful wedding dress for Linda. It was fitted white Chinese silk dress with a blusoon overdress, caplet sleeves, and a slit in each side of the overskirt. The waist was tied with a wide silk belt and bow. On the day of the wedding, my stepbrother, Reverend Dr. Oliver, uh, performed the ceremony at the farm, and he oversaw the exchange of vows. Everything went smoothly, just as we had rehearsed. He took us through the wedding vows, and then he said, I now pronounce you husband and wife. Then he added, salute the bride. I was stunned. We had not rehearsed that part. The word was nowhere in my notes. What was I supposed to do? My mind flashed to my high school days in the Army cadets where I had to salute almost every senior person who walked by me. I slowly started to raise my right hand to my brow. Linda, understanding exactly what was about to happen, quickly grabbed my arm and instead wrapped it around her waist. We embraced the warm applause of our guests. It was a late start to a long, successful marriage of more than 40 years. <laughs> Thank you so much. That is such a good story. Um, before we wrap it up tonight, uh, I'll open it up to you guys. Does anyone have any questions for Senator Oliver? Um, if not, and I'll just give you a moment to think about it, um, 
what we'll do uh, afterward is uh, we're going to move out into uh, the coffee shop and Senator Oliver will be available to sign books and to chat with anyone who wants to have a chat. So, any questions? You guys all know him very well. Oh, there's one in the back. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Jamie. I've talked to you before. And my question is, when you were telling some of these corporations uh, and businesses that a diverse staff or a staff that had equality built into its design was efficient, what was your uh, argument or your proof that it was efficient? And the reason I ask this is just because I'm a manager. I have uh, managed diverse staff and found it very, very efficient. And I don't have as much data on why. I just knew that the productivity from my experience was, was more. But when you were telling these, these uh, corporations that, that did not necessarily understand how diversity could be not only beneficial morally, but in terms of the productivity, what was your argument to convince them? Well, the bottom line, the balance sheet. You, you, you make you make more profits if, if you can uh, get more productivity out of a willing stop. And you can make more profits if you can have a product that's going to be able to be sold around the world. And uh, it, it's called group think. That's what they were, get, were getting before, before they brought in uh, diversity and different views. And so the, the, the classic example from some of, the, some of the studies in the States is you might get nine white men in black suits sitting around a boardroom, all having gone to Harvard and Yale, and all having the same MBA uh, or law degree, all making the same, all playing in the same golf court clubs and <clears throat> making the same decision. Then you have the other group made up of men and women and people from different countries speaking different languages. A lot of these people can speak three or four different languages and they bring that to the table. And so they were coming up with much better solutions to problems and to the product that was being, being produced. And in the end, it's more profitable and, and it's reflected in the balance sheet. And that's what business people look at. Any other questions? All right. Uh, well, on behalf of Nimbus and myself and Senator Oliver, I'd just like to say thank you to everyone for coming out tonight. And thank you, Don, for this wonderful book. Mm -hmm.